On this edition of Manned Space, we experience the drama of the Apollo 13 moon flight and look at a collectible that kept its cool while other components failed. May 5, 1961, Alan Shepard became the first American to fly in space. But by the spring of 1965, an inner ear disorder grounded America's first astronaut. Concerned for his well-being, NASA doctors removed Shepard from the flight rotation, thus excluding him from any upcoming space missions. Such was Shepard's fate until 1970 when, after years of flying a desk, Shepard underwent surgery that reversed the inner ear disorder that kept him on the ground. With his flight status reinstated, Shepard at once began lobbying Deke Slayton, his old friend and head of the astronaut office, for an Apollo mission assignment. At the time, the crew of Apollo 12 had been deep in training for their upcoming flight. However, Slayton had not formally announced the crew assignment for Apollo 13. At Shepard's urging, Slayton proposed to NASA's upper management that Shepard be assigned commander of Apollo 13. Concerned with Shepard's lack of spaceflight experience and training, NASA managers dismissed the idea out of hand. Shepard instead would command the crew of Apollo 14. The job of commanding Apollo 13 fell to Jim Lovell. By this time, Lovell was already a veteran of three space flights. In 1965, Lovell was aboard Gemini 7 with Frank Borman when the two men spent 14 days in space, at that time a space endurance record. He went on to command Gemini 12, the final mission of the Gemini program. And in December of 1968, Lovell was command module pilot when Apollo 8 became the first manned mission to the moon. Scheduled to join Lovell on Apollo 13 was Command Module Pilot Ken Mattingly. Mattingly was part of the support crew for Apollo 8 and trained as Backup Command Module Pilot for Apollo 11. Selected to serve as Lunar Module Pilot was Fred Hayes. Hayes had served as Backup Lunar Module Pilot for Apollos 8 and 11 before being assigned to Apollo 13. According to Jim Lovell, preparations for the Apollo 13 flight went flawlessly. Set to launch on April 11, 1970, the crew of Apollo 13 hit a snag just a week before liftoff. Backup Lunar Module pilot Charlie Duke had been stricken with the German measles and unwittingly exposed the Apollo 13 crew. Because Ken Mattingly had not had the German measles before, NASA doctors worried he might fall ill during the mission and he was therefore bumped from the flight. Backup command module pilot Jack Swigert would therefore move into the primary role. Finally, on the morning of April 11th, with the crew issues resolved, Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert readied themselves for launch. After completing breakfast, the crew suited up before heading to Launch Complex 39A for an on-time liftoff. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at 2.13. The Saturn V building up to 7.6 million pounds of thrust and it has cleared the tower. Despite the premature shutdown of the Saturn V second stage inboard engine, the crew of Apollo 13 achieved Earth orbit. At 1 hour 42 minutes and 16 seconds mission elapsed time, the crew of Apollo 13 was given the go for translunar injection, the rocket burn that would send them toward the moon. Then, less than an hour later, the burn complete, Apollo 13 was on its way. By day three of the mission, Apollo 13 was more than 140,000 nautical miles from Earth. The day started with the crew fast asleep. All systems on board the spacecraft were functioning normally. 
The flight plan called for a light workload this day, highlighted by a televised tour of the lunar module later in the day. At 54 hours 55 minutes since their launch, the crew of Apollo 13 was at an altitude of over 176,000 nautical miles, traveling nearly 3,300 feet per second. The TV transmission was scheduled to begin in five minutes. Inside Mission Control, serving as flight director, was former Marine fighter pilot Eugene Kranz. Kranz had been at NASA since Project Mercury, during which he wrote many of the procedures used by Mission Control and served as assistant flight director for Scott Carpenter's Aurora 7 mission in 1962. The man serving as capsule communicator was future Skylab and Space Shuttle astronaut Jack Lausma. Lausma joined NASA in 1966 and served on the support crews of Apollo 9 and 10. At exactly 55 hours and 8 seconds mission elapsed time, he radioed the crew to tell them Houston was ready for the TV transmission. Fifteen minutes later, the astronauts were beaming television images from inside the command and lunar modules. During the 30-minute transmission, Lovell was shown traversing the tunnel that joined the two spacecraft. Hayes demonstrated a new innovation for their walk on the moon, a drink bag that was placed inside the neck ring of their spacesuit that would allow them to drink while on the lunar surface. They also transmitted images of their ultimate destination. At 55 hours, 46 minutes, and 11 seconds mission elapsed time, the TV transmission was concluded. This is the crew of Apollo 13, wish everybody there a nice evening and uh, we're just about ready to close out our inspection of Aquarius and get back for a pleasant evening at Odyssey. Good night. Thank you, 13. Minutes after the conclusion of the TV transmission, Electrical, Environmental, and Consumables Manager, or ECOM, Cy Liebergott, requested the crew stir the supercooled oxygen in the spacecraft oxygen tank to prevent the gas from getting slushy due to its cold temperature. Capcom Jack Lausma radioed the request to the crew of Apollo 13. Dan, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. In addition, I uh, have a shaft and trunnion okay. for a look at the Comet Bennett if you need it. Stand by. Okay, uh, Houston, we've had a problem here. Can say again, please. Uh, -huh. uh Houston, we've had a problem. As soon as Jack Swigert threw the switch to initiate the stir, the oxygen tank exploded without warning. Once the switch was thrown, power was sent via Teflon-shielded wires within the tank, which had been damaged prior to the flight by excessive heat. The resulting spark from the damaged wires ignited the oxygen, which caused the explosion. At 56 hours, 9 minutes, and 7 seconds mission elapsed time, the crew reported a very disconcerting observation. Now, look to me, looking out the uh, hatch, so we are venting something. We are, uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. Roger, we copy your venting. The news of something venting was disquieting to mission control personnel. It was now clear that whatever the problem, it was not an instrumentation issue. Flight Director Gene Kranz was already considering the lunar module as a lifeboat for the three astronauts. Apollo 13 was now nearly 177,000 nautical miles from Earth traveling toward the moon. An hour since the initial explosion, mission controllers in Houston and the crew aboard the spacecraft continued to try to find solutions to the problem of falling oxygen levels in the command module. At 57 hours, 6 minutes, mission elapsed time, Flight Director Gene Kranz handed off responsibility for mission control to Glenn Lunny and his team. At once, Lunny begins questioning the lunar module people in mission control about how to rapidly power up the lunar module and ready it for the crew. Now almost 60 hours mission elapsed time, the command module has been powered down and the crew has moved into the lunar module. 
They are still 20 hours from the moon, which they will circle and hopefully be flung back toward Earth for the trip home. The crew would first get a much needed rest period. At 68 hours, 47 minutes, mission elapsed time, the crew emerged from their rest period to prepare for the upcoming trip around the moon. While mission controllers continue to monitor the systems of the command and lunar modules, astronauts in the lunar module simulator were practicing maneuvers the crew would need to successfully swing around the moon back toward Earth. Then, more than 77 hours since its launch from the Kennedy Space Center, and while 421 nautical miles above the lunar surface, the crew of Apollo 13 slipped behind the moon. Out of sight of Earth, there was no radio contact with the crew. Mission controllers would have to wait for Apollo 13 to re-emerge from behind the moon to confirm their planning had worked and the crew was indeed heading home. At 77 hours, 38 minutes mission elapsed time, NASA's public affairs officer announced what mission controllers already knew. Apollo 13 had indeed rounded the corner and was heading back toward Earth. Over the course of the next several days, the crew had to adapt to the cramped and cold environment they were living in, while mission controllers on the ground wrestled with developing new procedures to get the astronauts home. Day six would be a busy one for the astronauts. Scheduled to splash down this day, there would be a final course correction undertaken to ensure a safe return through the atmosphere before splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. But first, the command module would have to be reactivated. Aquarius Houston. Go ahead. Okay, uh, you're go to start uh, powering up the command module. Right now, we're starting now. Also, before they could return home, the crew would have to jettison the damaged part of their vehicle called the service module, as it was not designed to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. What the astronauts saw when they released the service module shocked them all. Uh, 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 copy that. We copied that report uh, from Jim Lovell of service module separation at uh, 138 hours, uh, 2 minutes, 8 seconds. And there's one all side of that big uh, business. Is that right? Right by the high gate antenna, the whole panel is blown out, almost from the uh, base to the uh, engine. As the service module drifted away, the crew still had left to jettison their lifeboat, the lunar module they named Aquarius. Left jettison. Okay, copy that. Farewell, Aquarius. Okay, thank you. This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 141 hours, 31 minutes into the flight. Uh, we've had lunar module jettison. Apollo 13, the age of Aquarius ended at uh, 141 hours, 30 minutes, ground elapsed time. With their command module back online and free from no longer needed hardware, the crew readied for the final leg of their trip home, a fiery re-entry through the atmosphere and a splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. Odyssey Houston, we show you on the mains, it really looks great. An extremely loud applause as Apollo 13 on uh, main shoots comes through loud and clear on the television display here. The crew of Apollo 13 had come within three and a half miles of the recovery vessel USS Iwo Jima. The astronauts were picked up by helicopter and transported to the ship where they received a red carpet welcome and a congratulatory call from the President of the United States. For their part, flight directors Gene Kranz, Glenn Lunny, Jerry Griffin, and Milt Windler received the Presidential Medal of Freedom for their work in getting the crew of Apollo 13 home safely. The collectible we look at today was actually on the command module Odyssey during this harrowing flight. We're looking at Odyssey on the deck of the USS Iwo Jima shortly after it was recovered from the ocean. Note how it appears to be covered in a gold-colored wrapping. In fact, the wrapping is a product called Kapton, spelled K-A-P-T-O-N. It was developed by DuPont. Among the characteristics of Kapton that made it attractive to NASA engineers is its ability to remain stable in the most extreme temperatures. 
The entire exterior of the Apollo spacecraft was covered with Kapton as part of a multi-element system to protect the vehicle and its occupants from extreme temperatures. In addition to its use on the command module, it was widely used on the descent stage of the lunar module as well. It was used in the construction of Apollo spacesuits, and it continues to be used widely today in a host of aerospace applications. We're looking at two swatches of captain foil that were removed from Apollo 13 command module Odyssey. It tells us that the fragments are actual pieces of Kapton foil removed from the Apollo 13 command module number 109 called Odyssey, which flew nearly 143 hours in space around the moon and back on April 11th to April 17th, 1970. It was removed from the spacecraft after splashdown. It has been signed by Apollo 13 lunar module pilot Fred Hayes who has included the inscription, it did a great job as a cloud of frosty air poured out of Odyssey when the hatch was opened. He signs it, Fred Hayes, Apollo 13, LMP. Included on the display is a photograph of Odyssey being brought aboard the USS Iwo Jima, a photograph of the damaged service module as seen by the crew of Apollo 11, and a description of the flight and explanation about Kapton foil. I acquired this historic space-flown artifact in an auction put on by the American Space Museum. Do you remember the flight of Apollo 13? Maybe you or someone you know worked on the mission. If so, tell us about it in the comments section. Thanks again for watching Man Space. Please watch for upcoming videos at least twice a week, during which I'll discuss the history of the space program by highlighting artifacts and memorabilia from my extensive space collection. Also, please like, subscribe, and click the notification button for more great content about manned space.